The word of the Lord, which forms a portion for our sermon text this morning, comes to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, starting at verse 13. Someone from the crowd said to him, that is Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said to him, Man, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbiter over you? Then he said to them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because a man's life is not measured by how many possessions he has. He told them a parable. The land of a certain rich man produced very well. He was thinking to himself, What will I do? Because I do not have anywhere to store my crops. He said, This is what I will do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and goods. And I will tell my soul, Soul, you have many goods stored up for, your, for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your soul will be demanded from you. Now who will get what you have prepared? That is how it will be for anyone who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the word of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Mercy, grace, and peace are yours through our God and Father and through your Savior, Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. Who wants to be a millionaire? This is a question in the name of a once popular TV game show where contestants had a chance of winning $1 million by simply answering trivia questions. But the whole premise of that game show is quite obvious, isn't it? I mean, who wouldn't want to be a millionaire? If you said, I don't want to be a millionaire, well, you had to be crazy, right? Well, not exactly. This would, however, seem quite crazy to anyone in our society today. Our society indeed promotes riches. We tend to subscribe the idea that Greed is not necessarily a bad thing. Greed can be good. We don't view people the same based on what they have, either good or bad. If someone is wealthy, then they are either admired or they're envied. But they are viewed differently. We also don't consider uh, greed in the same way that we might consider other sins. If someone, for instance, murdered somebody, well, we would all deplore that act. But if someone amassed a large amount of money, perhaps by not quite so honest means, we wouldn't necessarily deplore that. That person might be even praised. Who wouldn't want to be a millionaire? But why is that so obviously true? Why do we as a society want riches? Well, what does wealth really mean? At the end of the day, great amounts of wealth mean great amounts of options. If you have great wealth, well, you could choose what you would spend your time on. You could choose to buy any number of things, and you could choose what you want to do instead of being forced to do anything. Being wealthy means you call your own shots. But of course, we know there's always a price to be paid. Jesus said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? People think that having money means you can do whatever you want. But that's not true. The Ten Commandments apply to both rich and poor alike. We are all sinful, and because of that sin, we will all end up in the same state that is dead. The goal shouldn't be to accumulate as much wealth as we possibly can. Rather, the goal should be what Jesus points out here in this text. We shouldn't desire riches above all else like the world does. Instead, we should want to be rich toward God. So we pray, Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Our whole text is really introduced by this one person who came up to Jesus and asked him this question. 
It has been said that family and business do not mix. That's largely true if you think about it because of you have a responsibility to both parties. Feelings can get hurt easily when they do or responsibilities can be neglected. But in Israel, this was always the case. Inheritance was always a big factor in Israel, and typically the oldest male in the family got the lion's share of that inheritance once the father died. And this was designed as a way for families to keep their own family properties. But still, this question is kind of coming out of left field, isn't it, for Jesus here? Well, yes and no. It wasn't uncommon for a rabbi to receive a question like this. Typically, rabbis were asked about their knowledge of the Torah to settle inheritance disputes. But this was no ordinary rabbi. You can tell just by the wording of this man's question, it seemed like he wasn't really focusing on the right thing. Big picture, after all, this man was standing in front of the Lamb of God who's about to take away the sins of the world, and yet he bends the ear of the divine Son of Man over this matter of family inheritance. But still, the person does bring up a good topic which Jesus would talk about. He talks about it a lot in the Gospels, actually. Jesus' conclusion to this man's question brings about the principle on which the rest of the text is based. Watch out and be on guard against all greed, because one's man, a man's life is not measured by how many possessions he has. Has anybody ever told you, your money is no good here? I can see only two different scenarios in which that phrase would be uttered. On the positive side, if someone told you, your money is no good here, well, it'd be that the person either admires you or respects you so much that they would refuse payment for the services they were offering you. In this case, it'd be on the house, as we like to call it. But the other case that I could see is on the negative side. Someone might tell you, your money is no good here. That is, the money you're trying to use is not going to work in this place. Anyone who has traveled internationally will tell you that this is the case. Our American dollar indeed has spending power, but that's mostly here in America. Try traveling to a foreign country and spending a $20 bill. It's not going to work in most cases. You probably first need to get your money changed into the currency used at the local country, and usually that's for a fee. But it's also a principle spiritually. We like to think that wealthy people have answers to questions. They must have done something right after all to amass that wealth. But the fact of the matter is that great possessions or great wealth really mean very little when it comes to the kingdom of God. The world that we live in tells us that if we require enough money, we can do whatever we want but no amount of money will get a man into heaven. Jesus brings up the following parable to illustrate this point. It's one of many parables demonstrating what money can and can't do in the kingdom of God. Think about the parable of the rich man and poor Lazarus. The rich man lived a lavish life. The poor man lived in depravity and agony at his gates. When it was all over, Lazarus went to heaven and the rich man went to agony. It was there where the rich man would have given everything he had just for a drop of water to cool his tongue. But that's not how it works. His money was really not good there. But what was wrong with this man in this parable? The land of a certain rich man produced very well. He was thinking to himself, what, what will I do? Because I do not have anywhere to store my crops. He said, this is what I will do. I will build down my barns, pull down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and goods. And I will tell my soul, soul, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. What is wrong with this plan? It's not that bad of a plan in and of itself. 
The man took what he had been given, and he planned on making more with it. There isn't anything wrong with that. Indeed, God wants us to take what we have been given, our time, our talents, our, and our possessions, and he wants us to use them, to invest them. He himself has personally given them to us. The problem was not the man's plan. The problem was the man's attitude. He does not see the things that, he have, that which he had been given for what they are, a gift. He sees the increase in growth as happenstance. And he determines that he will capitalize it on it and leverage it into an early retirement. Again, it's not wrong to have wealth or even a retirement plan, which is what this person is seemingly doing here. What is wrong is that he imagines that this great plan of his will be the answer to all of his problems. And that's a plan based on greed. And that is the temptation, of course, that comes from greed. We imagine that wealth it will equal peace of mind. But more often than not, it provides the opposite. Ecclesiastes 5 says, Anyone who loves money is never satisfied with money. And anyone who loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. The love of money has a way of being a spiritual crutch. All you can think about is getting more money. If money is viewed as the answer to all of your problems, well, then you really can't ever have enough because you will always have more problems. Our problems extend much further just then to this world. And at the end of the day, you can't take it with you. How then could you have money for the problem that exists outside of the world? Now, once again, maybe I haven't said it yet, but it needs to be said, money is not bad. There is nothing evil about money. Nothing evil in and of itself about money. It simply are, they simply are pieces of paper or perhaps material like gold or silver. They're not evil. Perhaps the most misquoted passage in all of the Bible came to us from our epistle reading this morning, 1 Timothy 6.10. People like to quote that to you and say, money is the root of all evil. That is not what the Holy Spirit is saying here. He says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. There's a big difference there. And we see it here. It wasn't wrong that the man in the parable had riches or that his land produced better than he expected. That was all given to him by God. The problem was his attitude to these possessions he had been given. He wanted more. Why? Well, he says so in our text. He wanted more so he could live an easy life. He wants to take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. The simple fact of the matter is that here on this earth, money is not evil. Money is also not good. It's our attitude towards money that makes it either good or evil. You could be rich or poor and have a godly attitude towards money. Or you could be rich or poor and have a bad, sinful attitude toward money. You could be resentful that you don't have enough of it. Or you could be reliant on it instead of on your Savior. Your money is no good here. It's how you treat it and what you do with it. Your money is no good here also because here is not where we are going. Have you ever had any foreign money left over from a trip? What will you do with that money? I suppose if you had a sizable amount of money left over, you could go back and exchange it back into our currency. But say you just had a little bit of money left over. What would you do with it? It wouldn't really be worth the trouble to change it back into the American dollar. You'd probably just hold on to it. I have a few coins from the last time I visited Canada, and I guess they could come in handy someday, but for the most part, they just sit on my desk as a paperweight. 
This is also true about our money here today. They say, well, you can't take it with you, and that's often used as an excuse to spend excessively. But that principle, you can't take it with you, is sound. You really can't take it with you. When Job suffered his greatest tragedy in life, losing all of his possessions and his family and his children, what was his conclusion? Naked I came in from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As Job points out, and as did First Timothy pointed out today too, we truly have nothing. We bring nothing into this world, and we truly take nothing out of it. Everyone knows that. But there's also more to it spiritually. Do we truly bring nothing into the world? No. We know from God's word that we do bring something into this world, and it's not good. We know from Psalm 51, And behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. As we enter into this world, we bring into it our own sinfulness, our deadness. We bring in sin. How do we leave? Well, that's really the question. Jesus came to this earth to pay for our sins. When he went to the cross, he took our sins there with him. We brought into this world our sinful baggage, when he en- but when Jesus entered this world, he did so to remove that baggage from us. When he died, he died so that we would not have to die in those sins which we were born into. And now we have the opportunity to take something out of this world. We have the opportunity to take that grace that God has given us through Jesus Christ our Lord and leave this world different than how we entered it. Not as sinful, dead, rebellious sinners, but rather as children of God destined to inherit eternal life in heaven. God said to him, You fool, this night your soul will be demanded from you. Now who will get what you have prepared? That is how it will be for anyone who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The conclusion here in Christ's parable is the negative side of the coin. If we don't have reliance on God and instead rely on money or really simply anything else, it will be the same conclusion for us as well. That is why we don't simply want to just be rich. If we are rich in terms of this world, that's great. But the real point is that we should never rely on anyone or anything more than we rely on God. This then begs the question, well, how can we be rich toward God, as Jesus tells us to do here? How is that possible? Well, to be rich toward God is, at the end of the day, to simply believe Believe what God tells you. Being rich toward God is to believe that God is the giver of all things, including what we have here in this life, whether it's family, possessions, wealth, or anything else. To be rich in God is to believe that God has given us life and salvation. To show that we believe that that one believes is to share in these same gifts with others. Give like God gives to us. This is, of course, the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach here in this parable. Behind it is the gospel of grace. Forgiveness is being bestowed as God's free gift to mankind through Jesus. That haunting question asked by God to the man is a terror to the one who only has riches in the terms of this world. But that same question, we find a comfort to us here today, us who are rich toward God. Who will get what you have prepared? I'm sure that the answer to that question in the parable would have been someone who would have inherited this great fortune of the landowner. He probably would have gotten quite a bit. It sounded like this guy had it pretty well made. But that wouldn't do any good for the soul of the man who was already dead, and it wouldn't do any good for the soul of the man who would inherit it either. 
But if you have an inheritance from God, well, that is something that we really can take with us. Jesus said in John chapter 14, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. God's question to the man is truly terrifying, but not to us who have mansions being prepared for us by Jesus himself. We will get what Jesus prepares for us, namely eternal life. Who wants to be a millionaire? Well, we'd be fooling ourselves, I'm sure, if we said that we don't want to be one. But at the same time, we are much richer than just that. We may not be worth millions here on this earth. We may not end up in Forbes magazine as one of the most wealthy Americans. But we have something far better for us, far better for our estate planned in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Dear Christians, our treasure is not here on this earth. Our treasure is in heaven. How then will we go about this earth, life in this earth, until we receive that everlasting reward in heaven? How do we use what God gives us? Well, responsibly, and always focused on that real treasure in heaven. That's where our hearts should be. Our treasure is in heaven, and we will not get there due to the fact that we're so good or that we might become rich, we might have a lot in this earth. No, we will get to our mansion in heaven due to the fact that Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sins and saved our souls. We get to heaven alone through the riches of Christ's grace and his gift toward us. It's true, you can't take most things with you, But you can take that grace with you. Not only can you take that grace with you, that grace will lead you to where you are going, where you need to go, to eternal paradise with Jesus forever. Amen. Please rise.